The Age of Reason, Part 2nd Preface to Part 2. I have mentioned in the former part of The Age of Reason that it had long been my intention to publish my thoughts upon religion, but that I had originally reserved it to a later period in life, intending it to be the last work I should undertake. The circumstances, however, which existed in France in the latter end of the year 1793, determined me to delay it no longer. The just and humane principles of the revolution, which philosophy had first diffused, had been departed from. The idea, always dangerous to society, as it is derogatory to the Almighty that priests could forgive sins, though it seemed to exist no longer, had blunted the feelings of humanity, and prepared man for the commission of all manner of crimes. The intolerant spirit of church persecutions had transferred itself into politics. The tribunal-styled revolutionary supplied the place of an inquisition, and the guillotine and the stake outdid the fire and faggot of the church. I saw many of my most intimate friends destroyed, others daily carried to prison, and I had reason to believe, and had also intimations given me, that the same danger was approaching myself. Under these disadvantages, I began the former part of the age of reason. I had, besides, neither Bible nor Testament to refer to, though I was writing against both. Nor could I procure any, notwithstanding which, I have produced a work that no Bible believer, though writing at his ease, and with a library of church books about him, can refute. Toward the latter end of December of that year, a motion was made and carried, to exclude foreigners from the convention. There were but two in it, and Charles excludes and myself, and I saw I was particularly pointed at by Burden Alloys in his speech on that motion. Conceiving, after this, that I had but a few days of liberty, I sat down and brought the work to a close as speedily as possible. And I had not finished it more than six hours, in the state it has since appeared, before a guard came there, about three in the morning, with an order signed by the two committees of public safety and surety general for putting me in our restation as a foreigner, and conveyed me to the prison of the Luxembourg. I contrived, on my way there, to call on Joel Barlow, and I put the manuscript of the work into his hands as more safe than in my possession in prison, and not knowing what might be the fate in France either of the writer or the work, I addressed it to the protection of the citizens of the United States. It is with justice that I say that the guard who executed this order, and the interpreter of the Committee of General Surety who accompanied them to examine my papers, treated me not only with civility, but with respect. The keeper of the Luxembourg, Benoit, a man of a good heart, showed to me every friendship in his power, as did also all his family while he continued in that station. He was removed from it, put into a wee station, and carried before the tribunal upon a malignant accusation, but acquitted. After I had been in the Luxembourg about three weeks, the Americans then in Paris went in a body to the convention to reclaim me as their countryman and friend. But were answered by the president, Vaudier, who was also president of the Committee of Surety General, and had signed the order for my wee station, that I was born in England. I heard no more, after this from any person out of the walls of the prison till the fall of Robespierre, on the 9th of Thermidor, July 27, 1794. About two months before this event I was seized with a fever, that in its progress had every symptom of becoming mortal, and from the effects of which I am not recovered. It was then that I remembered with renewed satisfaction, and congratulated myself most sincerely, on having written the former part of the Age of Reason. I had then but little expectation of surviving, and those about me had less. I know, therefore, by experience, the conscientious trial of my own principles. I was then with three chamber comrades, Joseph Van Hull, of Bruges, Charles Bastini, and Michael Rubens, of Louvain. The unceasing and anxious attention of these three friends to me, by night and by day, I remember with gratitude and mention with pleasure. It happened that a physician, Drive, Graham, and a surgeon, Mr. Bond, part of the suite of General O'Hara, were then in the Luxembourg. I asked not myself whether it be convenient to them, as meant under the English government, that I express to them my thanks, but should reproach myself if I did not, and also to the physician of the Luxembourg, Dr. Markowski. I have some reason to believe, because I cannot discover any other cause, that this illness preserved me in existence. Among the papers of Robespierre that were examined and reported upon to the convention by a committee of deputies, is a note in the handwriting of Robespierre, in the following words. Demander to you Thomas Paine's white decreed accusation, pour elle en red de la marique out en cutie la France. 
to demand that a decree of accusation be passed against Thomas Paine, for the interest of America, as well as of France. From what cause it was that the intention was not put in execution I know not, and cannot inform myself, and therefore I ascribe it to impossibility, on account of that illness. The convention, to repair as much as lay in their power the injustice I had sustained, invited me publicly and unanimously to return into the convention, and which I accepted to show I could bear an injury without permitting it to injure my principles or my disposition. It is not because right principles have been violated that they are to be abandoned. I have seen, since I have been at liberty, several publications written, some in America and some in England, as answers to the former part of the age of reason. If the authors of these can amuse themselves by so doing, I shall not interrupt them. They may write against the work, and against me, as much as they please, they do me more service than they intend, and I can have no objection that they write on. They will find, however, by this second part, without its being written as an answer to them, that they must return to their work, and spin their cobweb over again. The first is brushed away by accident. They will now find that I have furnished myself with a Bible and Testament, and I can say also that I have found them to be much worse books than I had conceived. If I have erred in anything in the former part of the age of reason, it has been by speaking better of some parts of those books than they have deserved. I observe that all my opponents resort, more or less, to what they call scripture evidence and Bible authority to help them out. They are so little masters of the subject, as to confound a dispute about authenticity with a dispute about doctrines. I will, however, put them right, that if they should be disposed to write any more, they may know how to begin. October 1795. Thomas Paine. Chapter 1. As to the Old Testament. It has often been said, that anything may be proved from the Bible, but before anything can be admitted as proved by the Bible, the Bible itself must be proved to be true. For if the Bible be not true, or the truth of it be doubtful, it ceases to have authority, and cannot be admitted as proof of anything. It has been the practice of all Christian commentators on the Bible, and of all Christian priests and preachers, to impose the Bible on the world as a mass of truth and as the Word of God. They have disputed and wrangled, and anathematized each other about the supposed meaning of particular parts and passages therein. One has said and insisted that such a passage meant such a thing, another that it meant directly the contrary, and a third, that it meant neither one nor the other, but something different from both and this they call understanding the Bible. It has happened that all the answers which I have seen to the former part of the age of reason have been written by priests, and these pious men, like their predecessors, contend and wrangle, and pretend to understand the Bible. Each understands it differently, but each understands it best, and they have agreed in nothing but in telling their readers that Thomas Paine understands it not. Now, instead of wasting their time, and heating themselves in, fractious disputations about doctrinal points drawn from the Bible, these men ought to know, and if they do not, it is civility to inform them, that the first thing to be understood is, whether there is sufficient authority for believing the Bible to be the word of God, or whether there is not. There are matters in that book, said to be done by the express command of God, that are as shocking to humanity and to every idea we have of moral justice as anything done by Robespierre, by Carrier, by Joseph Le Bon, in France, by the English government in the East Indies, or by any other assassin in modern times. When we read in the books ascribed to Moses, Joshua, etc., that they, the Israelites, came by stealth upon whole nations of people, who, as history itself shows, had given them no offense, that they put all those nations to the sword, that they spared neither age nor infancy, that they utterly destroyed men, women, and children that they left not a soul to breathe expressions that are repeated over and over again in those books, and that, too, with exulting ferocity are we sure these things are facts? Are we sure that the Creator of man commissioned these things to be done? And are we sure that the books that tell us so were written by his authority? It is not the antiquity of a tale that is any evidence of its truth. On the contrary, it is a symptom of its being fabulous. For the more ancient any history pretends to be, the more it has the resemblance of a fable. The origin of every nation is buried in fabulous tradition, and that of the Jews is as much to be suspected as any other. To charge the commission of acts upon the Almighty, which, in their own nature, and by every rule of moral justice, 
are crimes, as all assassination is, and more especially the assassination of infants, is matter of serious concern. The Bible tells us, that those assassinations were done by the express command of God. To believe, therefore, the Bible to be true, we must not believe all our belief in the moral justice of God. For wherein could crying or smiling infants offend? And to read the Bible without horror, we must undo everything that is tender, sympathizing, and benevolent in the heart of man. Speaking for myself, if I had no other evidence that the Bible is fabulous than the sacrifice I must make to believe it. To be true, that alone would be sufficient to determine my choice. But in addition to all the moral evidence against the Bible, I will in the progress of this work produce such other evidence as even a priest cannot deny, and show, from that evidence, that the Bible is not entitled to credit as being the Word of God. But, before I proceed to this examination, I will show wherein the Bible differs from all other ancient writings with respect to the nature of the evidence necessary to establish its authenticity, and this is the more proper to be done because the advocates of the Bible, in their answers to the former part of the Age of Reason, undertake to say, and they put some stress thereon, that the authenticity of the Bible is as well established as that of any other ancient book, as if our belief of the one could become any rule for our belief of the other. I know, however, but of one ancient book that authoritatively challenges universal consent and belief, and that is Euclid's Elements of Geometry. Asterisk and the reason is, because it is a book of Self-evident demonstration, entirely independent of its author, and of everything relating to time, place, and circumstance. The matters contained in that book would have the same authority they now have, had they been written by any other person, or had the work been anonymous, or had the author never been known. For the identical certainty of who is the author, makes no part of our belief of the matters contained in the book. But it is quite otherwise with respect to the books ascribed to Moses, to Joshua, to Samuel, etc. Those are books of testimony, and they testify of things naturally incredible. And therefore, the whole of our belief as to the authenticity of those books rests, in the first place, upon the certainty that they were written by Moses, Joshua, and Samuel. Secondly upon the credit we give to their testimony. We may believe the first, that is, we may believe the certainty of the authorship, and yet not the testimony, in the same manner that we may believe that a certain person gave evidence upon a case and yet not believe the evidence that he gave. But if it should be found that the books ascribed to Moses, Joshua, and Samuel, were not written by Moses, Joshua, and Samuel, every part of the authority and authenticity of those books is gone at once. For there can be no such thing as forged or inventive testimony, neither can there be anonymous testimony, more especially as to things naturally incredible, such as that of talking with God face to face, or that of the sun and moon standing still at the command of Amman. The greatest part of the other ancient books are works of genius. Of which kind are those ascribed to Homer, to Plato, to Aristotle, to Demosthenes, to Cicero, etc. Here, again, the author is not essential in the credit we give to any of those works, for, as works of genius, they would have the same merit they have now, were they anonymous. Nobody believes the Trojan story, as related by Homer, to be true for it is the poet only that is admired, and the merit of the poet will remain, though the story be fabulous. But if we disbelieve the matters related by the Bible authors, Moses for instance, as we disbelieve the things related by Homer, there remains nothing of Moses in our estimation, but an impostor. As to the ancient historians, from Herodotus to Tacitus, we credit them as far as they relate things probable and credible, and no farther. For if we do, we must believe the two miracles which Tacitus relates were performed by Vespasian, that of curing a lame man and a blind man, in just the same manner as the same things are told of Jesus Christ by his historians. We must also believe the miracle cited by Josephus, that of the Sea of Pamphylia opening to let Alexander and his army pass, as is related of the Red Sea in Exodus. These miracles are quite as well authenticated as the Bible miracles, and yet we do not believe them. Consequently the degree of evidence necessary to establish our belief of things naturally incredible, whether in the Bible or elsewhere, is far greater than that which obtains our belief to natural and probable things. And therefore the advocates for the Bible have no claim to our belief of the Bible, because that we believe things stated in other ancient writings, since we believe the things stated in these writings no further than they are probable and credible, or because they are self-evident, like Euclid, or admire them because they are elegant, like Homer, 
or approve of them because they are sedate, like Plato, or judicious, like Aristotle. Osterask Euclid, according to chronological history, lived 300 years before Christ, and about 100 before Archimedes. He was of the city of Alexandria, in Egypt. Having premised these things, I proceed to examine the authenticity of the Bible, and I begin with what are called the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. My intention is to show that those books are spurious, and that Moses is not the author of them, and still further, that they were not written in the time of Moses, nor till several hundred years afterward, that they are no other than an attempted history of the life of Moses, and of the times in which he is said to have lived and also of the times prior thereto, written by some very ignorant and stupid pretenders to authorship, several hundred years after the death of Moses, as men now write histories of things that happened, or are supposed to have happened, several hundred or several thousand years ago. The evidence that I shall produce in this case is from the books themselves, and I shall confine myself to this evidence only. Were I to refer for proof to any of the ancient authors whom the advocates of the Bible call profane authors, they would controvert that authority, as I controvert theirs. I will therefore meet them on their own ground, and oppose them with their own weapon, the Bible. In the first place, there is no affirmative evidence that Moses is the author of those books, and that he is the author, is an altogether unfounded opinion, got abroad nobody knows how. The style and manner in which those books were written give no room to believe, or even to suppose, they were written by Moses for it is altogether the style and manner of another person speaking of Moses. In Exodus, Leviticus and Numbers, for everything in Genesis is prior to the time of Moses, and not the least allusion is made to him therein, the whole, I say, of these books is in the third person. It is always, the Lord said unto Moses, or Moses said unto the Lord, or Moses said unto the people, or the people said unto Moses. And this is the style and manner that historians use in speaking of the persons whose lives and actions they are writing. It may be said that a man may speak of himself in the third person, and therefore it may be. Suppose that Moses did. But supposition proves nothing. And if the advocates for the belief that Moses wrote these books himself have nothing better to advance than supposition, they may as well be silent. But granting the grammatical right that Moses might speak of himself in the third person, because any man might speak of himself in that manner, it cannot be admitted as a fact in those books that it is Moses who speaks, without rendering Moses truly ridiculous and absurd. For example, Numbers, chap. 12. Ver. 3. Now the man Moses was very meek, above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. If Moses said this of himself, instead of being the meekest of men, he was one of the most vain and arrogant of coxcombs and the advocates for those books may now take which side they please, for both sides are against them. If Moses was not the author, the books are without authority. And if he was the author, the author is without credit, because to boast of meanness is the reverse of meanness, and is a lie in sentiment. In Deuteronomy, the style and manner of writing marks more evidently than in the former books that Moses is not the writer. The manner here used is dramatical. The writer opens the subject by a short introductory discourse, and then introduces Moses in the act of speaking, and when he has made Moses finish his harangue, he, the writer, resumes his own part, and speaks till he brings Moses forward again, and at last closes the scene with an account of the death, funeral, and character of Moses. This interchange of speakers occurs four times in this book, from the first verse of the first chapter to the end of the fifth verse, it is the writer who speaks. He then introduces Moses as in the act of making his harangue, and this continues to the end of the fortieth verse of the fourth chapter. Here the writer drops Moses, and speaks historically of what was done in consequence of what Moses, when living, is supposed to have said, and which the writer has dramatically rehearsed. The writer opens the subject again in the first verse of the fifth chapter, though it is only by saying, that Moses called the people of Israel together. He then introduces Moses as before, and continues him, as in the act of speaking to the end of the 26th chapter. He does the same thing, at the beginning of the 27th chapter, and continues Moses, as in the act of speaking, to the end of the 28th chapter. At the 29th chapter the writer speaks again through the whole of the first verse and the first line of the second verse, where he introduces Moses for the last time, and continues him, as in the act of speaking, to the end of the 33rd chapter. The writer having now finished the rehearsal on the part of Moses, 
comes forward, and speaks through the whole of the last chapter. He begins by telling the reader that Moses went to the top of Pisgah, that he saw from thence the land which, the writer says, had been promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he, Moses, died there, in the land of Moab, but that no man knew with of his sepulchre unto this day, that is, unto the time in which the writer lived who wrote the book of Deuteronomy. The writer then tells us, that Moses was 120 years of age when he died that his eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And he concludes by saying that there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom, says this anonymous writer, the Lord knew face to face. Having thus shown, as far as grammatical evidence applies, that Moses was not the writer of those books, I will, after making a few observations on the inconsistencies of the writer of the book of Deuteronomy, proceed to show from the historical and chronological evidence contained in those books, that Moses was not, because he could not be, the writer of them, and consequently that there is no authority for believing that the inhuman and horrid butcheries of men, women, and children, told of in those books, were done, as those books say they were, at the command of God. It is a duty incumbent on every true deist, that he vindicate the moral justice of God against the calumnies of the Bible. The writer of the book of Deuteronomy, whoever he was, for it is not an anonymous work, is obscure, and also in contradiction with himself, in the account he has given of Moses. After telling that Moses went to the top of Pisgah, and it does not appear from any account that he ever came down again, he tells us that Moses died there in the land of Moab, and that he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab. But as there is no antecedent to the pronoun he, there is no knowing who he was that did bury him. If the writer meant that he, God, buried him, how should he, the writer, know it? Or why should we, the readers, believe him? Since we know not who the writer was that tells us so, for certainly Moses could not himself tell where he was buried. The writer also tells us, that no man knew with where the sepulchre of Moses is unto this day, meaning the time in which this writer lived. How then should he know that Moses was buried in a valley in the land of Moab? For as the writer lived long after the time of Moses, as is evident from his using the expression of unto this day, meaning a great length of time after the death of Moses, he certainly was not at his funeral. And on the other hand, it is impossible that Moses himself could say that no man knew with where the sepulchre is unto this day. To make Moses the speaker, would be an improvement on the play of a child that hides himself and cries nobody can find me, nobody can find Moses. This writer has nowhere told us how he came by the speeches which he has put into the mouth of Moses to speak, and therefore we have a right to conclude that he either composed them himself, or wrote them from oral tradition. One or the other of these is the more probable, since he has given in the fifth chapter a table of commandments, in which that called the fourth commandment is different from the fourth commandment in the twentieth chapter of Exodus. In that of Exodus, the reason given for keeping the seventh day is, because, says the commandment, God made the heavens and the earth in six days, and rested on the seventh. But in that of Deuteronomy, the reason given is that it was the day on which the children of Israel came out of Egypt, and therefore, says this commandment, the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day. This makes no mention of the creation, nor that of the coming out of Egypt. There are also many things given as laws of Moses in this book that are not to be found in any of the other books, among which is that inhuman and brutal law, chapter 21, verses 18, 19, 20 and 21, which authorizes parents, the father and the mother, to bring their own children to have them stoned to death for what it is pleased to call stubbornness. But priests have always been fond of preaching up Deuteronomy, for Deuteronomy preaches up tithes. And it is from this book, chap. XXV. Ver. 4, that they have taken the phrase, and applied it to tithing, that thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn, and that this might not escape observation, they have noted it in the table of contents at the head of the chapter, though it is only a single verse of less than two lines. Oh, priests. Priests. Ye are willing to be compared to an ox, for the sake of tithes. Though it is impossible for us to know identically who the writer of Deuteronomy was, it is not difficult to discover him professionally, that he was some Jewish priest, who lived, as I shall show in the course of this work, at least 350 years after the time of Moses. I come now to speak of the historical and chronological evidence. The chronology that I shall use is the Bible chronology, for I mean not to go out of the Bible for evidence of anything, but to make the Bible itself prove 
historically and chronologically, that Moses is not the author of the books ascribed to him. It is, therefore, proper that I inform the reader, such a one at least as may not have the opportunity of knowing it, that in the larger Bibles, and also in some smaller ones, there is a series of chronology printed in the margin of every page, for the purpose of showing how long the historical matters stated in each page happened, or are supposed to have happened, before Christ, and, consequently, the distance of time between one historical circumstance and another. I begin with the book of Genesis. In the fourteenth chapter of Genesis, the writer gives an account of Lot being taken prisoner in a battle between the four kings against five, and carried off, and that when the account of Lot being taken, came to Abraham, he armed all his household and marched to rescue Lot from the captors, and that he pursued them unto Denver. 14. To show in what manner this expression pursuing them unto Dan applies to the case in question, I will refer to two circumstances. The one in America, the other in France. The city now called New York, in America, was originally New Amsterdam, and the town in France, lately called Haver Marat, was before called Haver de Grace. New Amsterdam was changed to New York in the year 1664, Haver de Grace to Haver Marat in 1793. Should, therefore, any writing be found, though without date, in which the name of New York should be mentioned, it would be certain evidence that such a uniting could not have been written before, but must have been written after New Amsterdam was changed to New York, and consequently, not till after the year 1664, or at least during the course of that year. And, in like manner, any dateless writing with the name of Haver Marat would be certain evidence that such a writing must have been written after Haver de Grace became Haver Marat, and consequently not till after the year 1793, or at least during the course of that year. I now come to the application of those cases, and to show that there was no such place as Dan, till many years after the death of Moses, and consequently, that Moses could not be the writer of the book of Genesis, where this account of pursuing them unto Dan is given. The place that is called Dan in the Bible was originally a town of the Gentiles called Laish. And when the tribe of Dan seized upon this town, they changed its name to Dan, in commemoration of Dan, who was the father of that tribe, and the great-grandson of Abraham. To establish this in proof, it is necessary to refer from Genesis to the 18th chapter of the book called the Book of Judges. It is there said, ver. 27, that they, the Danites, came unto Laish to a people that were quiet and secure, and they smote them with the edge of the sword. The Bible is filled with murder, and burned the city with fire. And they built a city, ver. 28, and dwelt therein, and they called the name of the city Dan, after the name of Dan, their father, albeit the name of the city was Laish at the first. This account of the Danites taking possession of Laish and changing it to Dan, is placed in the book of Judges immediately after the death of Samson. The death of Samson is said to have happened 1120 years before Christ, and that of Moses 1451 before Christ. And, therefore, according to the historical arrangement, the place was not called Dan till 331 years after the death of Moses. There is a striking confusion between the historical and the chronological arrangement in the book of Judges. The five last chapters, as they stand in the book, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, are put chronologically before all the preceding chapters. They are made to be 28 years before the 16th chapter, 266 before the 15th, 235 before the 13th, 195 before the 9th, 90 before the 4th, and 15 years before the first chapter. This shows the uncertain and fabulous state of the Bible. According to the chronological arrangement, the taking of Laish and giving it the name of Dan is made to be twenty years after the death of Joshua, who was the successor of Moses. And by the historical order as it stands in the book, it is made to be three hundred six years after the death of Joshua, and three hundred thirty one after that of Moses. But they both exclude Moses from being the writer of Genesis, because, according to either of the statements, no such place as Dan existed in the time of Moses. And therefore the writer of Genesis must have been some person who lived after the town of Laish had the name of Dan. And who that person was nobody knows, and consequently the book of Genesis is anonymous and without authority. I proceed now to state another point of historical and chronological evidence, and to show therefrom, as in the preceding case, that Moses is not the author of the book of Genesis. 
In the 36th chapter of Genesis there is given a genealogy of the sons and descendants of Esau, who are called Edomites, and also a list, by name, of the kings of Edom, in enumerating of which, it is said, verse 31, and these are the kings that reigned in Edom, before there reigned any king over the children of Israel. Now, were any dateless writings to be found in which, speaking of any past events, the writer should say, these things happened before there was any congress in America, or before there was any convention in France, it would be evidence that such writing could not have been written before, and could only be written after there was a congress in America, or a convention in France, as the case might be, and, consequently, that it could not be written by any person who died before there was a congress in the one country or a convention in the other. Nothing is more frequent, as well in history as in conversation, than to refer to a fact in the room of a date. It is most natural so to do, first, because a fact fixes itself in the memory better than a date, secondly, because the fact includes the date, and serves to excite two ideas at once. And this manner of speaking by circumstances implies as positively that the fact alluded to as past as if it were so expressed. When a person speaking upon any matter, says, it was before I was married, or before my son was born, or before I went to America, or before I went to France, it is absolutely understood, and intended to be understood, that he had been married, that he has had a son, that he has been in America, or been in France. Language does not admit of using this mode of expression in any other sense. And whenever such an expression is found anywhere, it can only be understood in the sense in which it only could have been used. The passage, therefore, that I have quoted, that these are the kings that reigned in Edom, before there reigned any king over the children of Israel, dash could only have been written after the first king began to reign over them. And, consequently, that the book of Genesis, so far from having been written by Moses, could not have been written till the time of Saul at least. This is the positive sense of the passage. But the expression, any king, implies more kings than one, at least it implies two, and this will carry it to the time of David. And if taken in a general sense, it carries it through all the time of the Jewish monarchy. Had we met with this verse in any part of the Bible that professed to have been written after kings begin to reign in Israel, it would have been impossible not to have seen the application of it. It happens then that this is the case. The two books of Chronicles, which gave a history of all the kings, of Israel, are professedly, as well, as in fact, written after the Jewish monarchy began, and this verse that I have quoted, and all the remaining verses of the 36th chapter of Genesis, are word for word in the first chapter of Chronicles, beginning at the 43rd verse. It was with consistency that the writer of the Chronicles could say, as he has said, 1st Chron. Chap. I. Ver. 43, these are the kings that reigned in the land of Edom, before any king reigned over the children of Israel, because he was going to give, and has given, a list of the kings that had reigned in Israel. But as it is impossible that the same expression could have been used before the period, it is as certain as anything that can be proved from historical language that this part of Genesis is taken from Chronicles, and that Genesis is not so old as Chronicles, and probably not so old as the book of Homer or as Aesop's fables, admitting Homer to have been, as the tables of chronology state, contemporary with David or Solomon, and Aesop to have lived about the end of the Jewish monarchy. Take away from Genesis the belief that Moses was the author, on which only the strange belief that it is the word of God has stood, and there remains nothing of Genesis but an anonymous book of stories, fables, and traditionary or invented absurdities, or of downright lies. The story of even the serpent, and of Noah and his ark, drops to a level with the Arabian tales, without the merit of being entertaining, and the account of men living to eight and nine. Hundred years becomes as fabulous immortality of the giants of the mythology. Besides, the character of Moses, as stated in the Bible, is the most horrid that can be imagined. If those accounts be true, he was. The wretch that first began and carried on wars on the score or on the pretense of religion, and under that mask, or that infatuation, committed the most unexampled atrocities that are to be found in the history of any nation, of which I will state only one instance. When the Jewish army returned from one of their plundering and murdering excursions, the account goes on as follows, Numbers, Chap. XXXI. Ver. 13. And Moses, and Eleazar the priest, and all the princes of the congregation, went forth to meet them without the camp. 
and Moses was wroth with the officers of the host, with the captains over thousands, and captains over hundreds, which came from the battle. And Moses said unto them, Have ye saved all the women alive? Behold, these caused the children of Israel, through the counsel of Balaam, to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Now, therefore, kill every male among the little ones, and kill every woman that hath known a man by lying with him. But all the women children, that have not known a man by lying with him, keep alive for yourselves. Among the detestable villains that in any period of the world have disgraced the name of men, it is impossible to find a greater than Moses, if this account be true. Here is an order to butcher the boys, to massacre the mothers, and debauch the daughters. Let any mother put herself in the situation of those mothers. One child murdered, another destined to violation, and herself in the hands of an executioner. Let any daughter put herself in the situation of those daughters, destined as a prey to the murderers of a mother and a brother, and what will be their feelings? It is in vain that we attempt to impose upon nature, for nature will have her course, and the religion that tortures all her social ties is a false religion. After this detestable order, follows an account of the plunder taken, and the manner of dividing it. And here it is that the profitness of priestly hypocrisy increases the catalogue of crimes. Ver. 37 to 40, and the Lord's tribute of sheep was six hundred and three score and fifteen, and the beeves were thirty and six thousand, of which the Lord's tribute was three score and twelve, and the asses were thirty thousand and five hundred, of which the Lord's tribute was three score and one, and the persons were sixteen thousand, of which the Lord's tribute was thirty and two persons. In short, the matters contained in this chapter, as well as in many other parts of the Bible, are too horrid for humanity to read or for decency to hear, for it appears, from the thirty-fifth verse of this chapter, that the number of women children consigned to debauchery by the order of Moses was thirty-two thousand. People in general do not know what wickedness there is in this pretended word of God. Brought up in habits of superstition, they take it for granted that the Bible is true, and that it is good. They permit themselves not to doubt of it, and they carry the ideas they form of the benevolence of the Almighty to the book which they have been taught to believe was written by his authority. Good heavens! It is quite another thing. It is a book of lies, wickedness, and blasphemy. For what can be greater blasphemy than to ascribe the wickedness of man to the orders of the Almighty? But to return to my subject, that of showing that Moses is not the author of the books ascribed to him, and that the Bible is spurious. The two instances I have already given would be sufficient without any additional evidence, to invalidate the authenticity of any book that pretended to be four or five hundred years more ancient than the matters it speaks of, or refers to, as facts. For in the case of pursuing them unto Dan, and of the kings that reigned over the children of Israel, not even the flimsy pretense of prophecy can be pleaded. The expressions are in the pretter tense, and it would be downright idiotism to say that a man could prophesy in the pretter tense. But there are many other passages scattered throughout those books that unite in the same point of evidence. It is said in Exodus, another of the books ascribed to Moses, chap. 16. Verse 34, And the children of Israel did eat manna forty years until they came to a land inhabited. They did eat manna until they came unto the borders of the land of Canaan. Whether the children of Israel ate manna or not, or what manna was, or whether it was anything more than a kind of fungus or small mushroom, or other vegetable substance common to that part of the country, makes nothing to my argument. All that I mean to show is, that it is not Moses that could write this account, because the account extends itself beyond the life and time of Moses. Moses, according to the Bible, but it is such a book of lies and contradictions there is no knowing which part to believe, or whether any, died in the wilderness and never came upon the borders of the land of Canaan. And consequently it could not be he that said what the children of Israel did, or what they ate when they came there. This account of eating manna, which they tell us was written by Moses, extends itself to the time of Joshua, the successor of Moses. As appears by the account given in the book of Joshua, after the children of Israel had passed the river Jordan, and came unto the borders of the land of Canaan. Joshua, chap. V. Verse 12. And the manna ceased on the morrow, after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. But a more remarkable instance than this occurs in Deuteronomy, which, while it shows that Moses could not be the writer of that book, 
shows also the fabulous notions that prevailed at that time about giants. In the third chapter of Deuteronomy, among the conquests said to be made by Moses, is an account of the taking of Og, king of Bashan, v. 2. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rebuth of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of it, after the cubit of a man. A cubit is one foot nine eight 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 one o o t h s inches. The length, therefore, of the bed was sixteen feet four inches, and the breadth seven feet four inches. Thus much for this giant's bed. Now for the historical part, which, though the evidence is not so direct and positive as in the former cases, it is nevertheless very presumable and corroborating evidence, and is better than the best evidence on the contrary side. The writer, by way of proving the existence of this giant, refers to his bed as an ancient relic, and says, Is it not in Rabbath or Rabbah of the children of Ammon? Meaning that it is. For such is frequently the Bible a method of affirming a thing. But it could not be Moses that said this, because Moses could know nothing about Rabbah, nor of what was in it. Rabbah was not a city belonging to this giant king, nor was it one of the cities that Moses took. The knowledge, therefore, that this bed was at Rabbah, and of the particulars of its dimensions, must be referred to the time when Rabbah was taken, and this was not till four hundred years after the death of Moses. For which see to some. Chap. 12. Ver. 26. And Joab, David's general, fought against Rabbah of the children of Ammon, and took the royal city. As I am not undertaking to point out all the contradictions in time, place, and circumstance that abound in the books ascribed to Moses, and which prove to a demonstration that those books could not have been written by Moses, nor in the time of Moses, I proceed to the book of Joshua, and to show that Joshua is not the author of that book, and that it is anonymous and without authority. The evidence I shall produce is contained in the book itself. I will not go out of the Bible for proof against the supposed authenticity of the Bible. False testimony is always good against itself. Joshua, according to the first chapter of Joshua, was the immediate successor of Moses. He was, moreover, a military man, which Moses was not, and he continued as chief of the people of Israel twenty-five years, that is, from the time that Moses died, which, according to the Bible chronology, was 1451 years before Christ, until 1426 years before Christ, when, according to the same chronology, Joshua died. If, therefore, we find in this book, said to have been written by Joshua, reference to facts done after the death of Joshua, it is evidence that Joshua could not be the author, and also that the book could not have been written till after the time of the latest fact, which it records. As to the character of the book, it is horrid. It is a military history of rapine and murder, as savage and brutal as those recorded of his predecessor in villainy and hypocrisy, Moses. And the blasphemy consists, as in the former books, in ascribing those deeds to the orders of the Almighty. In the first place, the book of Joshua, as is the case in the preceding books, is written in the third person. It is the historian of Joshua that speaks, for it would have been absurd and vainglorious that Joshua should say of himself, as is said of him in the last verse of the sixth chapter, that his fame was noised throughout all the country. I now come more immediately to the proof. In the twenty-fourth chapter, ver. 31, it is said, And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua. Now, in the name of common sense, can it be Joshua that relates what people had done after he was dead? This account must not only have been written by some historian that lived after Joshua, but that lived also after the elders that outlived Joshua. There are several passages of a general meaning with respect to time scattered throughout the book of Joshua, that carries the time in which the book was written to a distance from the time of Joshua, but without marking by exclusion any particular time, as in the passage above quoted. In that passage, the time that intervened between the death of Joshua and the death of the elders is excluded descriptively and absolutely, and the evidence substantiates that the book could not have been written till after the death of the last. But though the passages to which I allude, and which I am going to quote, do not designate any particular time by exclusion, they imply a time far more distant from the days of Joshua than is contained between the death of Joshua and the death of the elders. 
such as the passage, chap. X. Ver. 14, where, after giving an account that the sun stood still upon Jabin, and the moon in the valley of Ajalon, at the command of Joshua, a tale only fit to amuse children, the passage says, and there was no day like that, before it, or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of Ammon. This tale of the sun standing still upon Mount Jabin, and the moon in the valley of Ajalon, is one of those fables that detects itself. Such a circumstance could not have happened without being known all over the world. One half would have wondered why the sun did not rise, and the other why it did not set. And the tradition of it would be universal, whereas there is not a nation in the world that knows anything about it. But why must the moon stand still? What occasion could there be for moonlight in the daytime, and that too while the sun shone? As a poetical figure, the whole is well enough. It is akin to that in the song of Deborah and Barak, the stars in their courses fought against Sisera. But it is inferior to the figurative declaration of Mahomet to the persons who came to expostulate with him on his goings on, wert thou, said he, to come to me with the sun in thy right hand and the moon in thy left, it should not alter my career. For Joshua to have exceeded Mahomet, he should have put the sun and moon one in each pocket, and carried them as Guy Fox carried his dark lantern, and taken them out to shine as he might happen to want them. The sublime and the ridiculous are often so nearly related that it is difficult to class them separately. One step above the sublime makes the ridiculous, and one step above the ridiculous makes the sublime again. The account, however, abstracted from the poetical fancy, shows the ignorance of Joshua, for he should have commanded the earth to have stood still. The time implied by the expression after it, that is, after that day, being put in comparison with all the time that passed before it, must, in order to give any expressive signification to the passage, mean a great length of time, for example, it would have been ridiculous to have said so the next day, or the next week, or the next month, or the next year. To give, therefore, meaning to the passage, comparative with the wonder it relates and the prior time. It alludes to, it must mean centuries of years. Less, however, than one would be trifling, and less than two would be barely admissible. A distant but general time is also expressed in the 8th chapter, where, after giving an account of the taking of the city of I, it is said, ver. 28, And Joshua burned I, and made it a heap forever, even a desolation unto this day. And again, ver. 29, Where, speaking of the king of I, whom Joshua had hanged, and buried at the entering of the gate, it is said, And he raised thereon a great heap of stones, which remaineth unto this day, that is, unto the day or time in which the writer of the book of Joshua lived. And again, in the tenth chapter, where, after speaking of the five kings, whom Joshua had hanged on five trees, and then thrown in a cave, it is said, and he laid great stones on the cave's mouth, which remain unto this very day. In enumerating the several exploits of Joshua, and of the tribes, and of the places, which they conquered or attempted, it is said, chap. 15. Ver. 63. As for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah could not drive them out. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah at Jerusalem unto this day. The question upon this passage is, at what time did the Jebusites and the children of Judah dwell together at Jerusalem? As this matter occurs again in the first chapter of Judges, I shall reserve my observations until I come to that part. Having thus shown from the book of Joshua itself without any auxiliary evidence whatever, that Joshua is not the author of that book, and that it is anonymous, and consequently without authority, I proceed as before mentioned, to the book of Judges. The book of Judges is anonymous on the face of it. And, therefore, even the pretense is wanting to call it the word of God. It has not so much as a nominal voucher. It is altogether fatherless. This book begins with the same expression as the book of Joshua. That of Joshua begins, chap. I. Verse 1, now after the death of Moses, etc. And this of the judges begins, now after the death of Joshua, etc. This, and the similarity of style between the two books, indicate that they are the work of the same author, but who he was is altogether unknown. The only point that the book proves, is that the author lived long after the time of Joshua. For though it begins as if it followed immediately after his death, the second chapter is an epitome or abstract of the whole book, which, according to the Bible chronology, extends its history through a space of 306 years. That is, from the death of Joshua, 1426 years before Christ, to the 
death of Samson, 1120 years before Christ, and only 25 years before Saul went to seek his father's asses, and was made king. But there is good reason to believe, that it was not written till the time of David, at least, and that the book of Joshua was not written before the same time. In the first chapter of Judges, the writer, after announcing the death of Joshua, proceeds to tell what happened between the children of Judah and the native inhabitants of the land of Canaan. In this statement, the writer, having abruptly mentioned Jerusalem in the seventh verse, says immediately after, in the eighth verse, by way of explanation, now the children of Judah had fought against Jerusalem, and had taken it. Consequently this book could not have been written before Jerusalem had been taken. The reader will recollect the quotation I have just before made from the fifteenth chapter of Joshua, verse 63, where it is said that the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah at Jerusalem unto this day, meaning the time when the book of Joshua was written. The evidence I have already produced to prove that the books I have hitherto treated of were not written by the persons to whom they are ascribed, nor till many years after their death, if such persons ever lived, is already so abundant that I can afford to admit this passage with less weight than I am entitled to draw from it. For the case is, that so far as the Bible can be credited as a history, the city of Jerusalem was not taken till the time of David, and consequently that the books of Joshua and of Judges were not written till after the commencement of the reign of David, which was 370 years after the death of Joshua. The name of the city that was afterward called Jerusalem was originally Jebus, or Jebusi, and was the capital of the Jebusites. The account of David's taking this city is given in 2 Samuel, chap. v. ver. 4, etc. Also in I. Kron. Chap. 14. Ver. 4, etc. There is no mention in any part of the Bible that it was ever taken before, nor any account that favors such an opinion. It is not said, either in Samuel or in Chronicles, that they utterly destroyed men, women and children, that they left not a soul to breathe, as is said of their other conquests, and the silence here observed implies that it was taken by capitulation, and that the Jebusites, the native inhabitants, continued to live in the place after it was taken. The account therefore, given in Joshua, that the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah at Jerusalem unto this day corresponds to no other time than after the taking of the city by David. Having now shown that every book in the Bible, from Genesis to Judges, is without authenticity, I come to the book of Ruth, an idle, bungling story, foolishly told, nobody knows by whom, about a strolling country girl creeping slyly to bed with her cousin Boaz. Pretty stuff indeed to be called the Word of God. It is, however, one of the best books in the Bible, for it is free from murder and rapine. I come next to the two books of Samuel, and to show that those books were not written by Samuel, nor till a great length of time after the death of Samuel, and that they are, like all the former books, anonymous and without authority. To be convinced that these books have been written much later than the time of Samuel, and consequently not by him, it is only necessary to read the account which the writer gives of Saul going to seek his father's asses, and of his interview with Samuel, of whom Saul went to inquire about those lost asses, as foolish people nowadays go to a conjurer to inquire after lost things. The writer, in relating this story of Saul, Samuel and the asses, does not tell it as a thing that has just then happened, but as an ancient story in the time this writer lived. For he tells it in the language or terms used at the time that Samuel lived, which obliges the writer to explain the story in the terms or language used in the time the writer lived. Samuel, in the account given of him, in the first of those books, chap 9, is called the seer, and it is by this term that Saul inquires after him, ver. 2, and as they, Saul and his servant went up the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water. And they said unto them, Is the seer here? Saul then went according to the direction of these maidens, and met Samuel without knowing him, and said unto him, Ver. 18, Tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house is? And Samuel answered Saul, and said, I am the seer. As the writer of the book of Samuel relates these questions and answers, in the language or manner of speaking used in the time they are said to have been spoken, and as that manner of speaking was out of use when this author wrote, he found it necessary, in order to make the story understood, to explain the terms in which these questions and answers are spoken. And he does this in the ninth verse, when he says, Before time, in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God. Thus he spake, Come, and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet, 
was before time called a seer. This proves, as I have before said, that the story of Saul, Samuel and the asses, was an ancient story at the time the book of Samuel was written, and consequently that Samuel did not write it, and that that book is without authenticity. But if we go further into those books the evidence is still more positive that Samuel is not the writer of them, for they relate things that did not happen till several years after the death of Samuel. Samuel died before Saul. For the first Samuel, chap. XXVIII. Tells that Saul and the witch of Ender conjured Samuel up after he was dead. Yet the history of the matters contained in those books is extended through the remaining part of Saul's life, and to the latter end of the life of David, who succeeded Saul. The account of the death and burial of Samuel a thing which he could not write himself is related in the 25th chapter of the first book of Samuel, and the chronology affixed to this chapter makes this to be 1060 years before Christ. Yet the history of this first book is brought down to 1056 years before Christ. That is, to the death of Saul, which was not till four years after the death of Samuel. The second book of Samuel begins with an account of things that did not happen till four years after Samuel was dead. For it begins with the reign of David, who succeeded Saul, and it goes on to the end of David's reign, which was forty-three years after the death of Samuel. And, therefore, the books are in themselves positive evidence that they were not written by Samuel. I have now gone through all the books in the first part of the Bible to which the names of persons are affixed, as being the authors of those books, and which the church, styling itself the Christian church, have imposed upon the world as the writings of Moses, Joshua and Samuel, and I have detected and proved the falsehood of this imposition. And now, ye priests of every description, who have preached and written against the former part of the age of reason, what have ye to say? Will ye, with all this massive evidence against you, and staring you in the face, still have the assurance to march into your pulpits and continue to impose these books on your congregations as the works of inspired penmen, and the word of God, when it is as evident as demonstration can make truth appear, that the persons who you say are the authors, are not the authors, and that ye know not who the authors are. What shadow of pretense have ye now to produce for continuing the blasphemous fraud? What have ye still to offer against the pure and moral religion of deism? in support of your system of falsehood, idolatry, and pretended revelation? Had the cruel and murderous orders with which the Bible is filled, and the numberless torturing executions of men, women and children, in consequence of those orders, been ascribed to some friend whose memory you revered, you would have glowed with satisfaction at detecting the falsehood of the charge, and gloried in defending his injured fame. Is it because ye are sunk in the cruelty of superstition, or feel no interest in the honor of your Creator, that ye listen to the horrid tales of the Bible, or hear them with callous indifference? The evidence I have produced, and shall produce in the course of this work, to prove that the Bible is without authority, will, while it wounds the stubbornness of a priest, relieve and tranquilize the minds of millions. It will free them from all those hard thoughts of the Almighty which Priestcraft and the Bible had infused into their minds, and which stood in everlasting opposition to all their ideas of his moral justice and benevolence. I come now to the two books of Kings, and the two books of Chronicles. Those books are altogether historical, and are chiefly confined to the lives and actions of the Jewish kings, who in general were a parcel of rascals. But these are matters with which we have no more concern than we have with the Roman emperor's or Homer's account of the Trojan War. Besides which, as those works are anonymous, and as we know nothing of the writer, or of his character, it is impossible for us to know what degree of credit to give to the matters related therein. Like all other ancient histories, they appear to be a jumble of fable and of fact, and of probable and of improbable things. But which distance of time and place, and change of circumstances in the world, have rendered obsolete and uninteresting. The chief use I shall make of those books will be that of comparing them with each other, and with other parts of the Bible, to show the confusion, contradiction, and cruelty in this pretended word of God. The first book of Kings begins with the reign of Solomon, which, according to the Bible chronology, was 1015 years before Christ. And the second book ends 588 years before Christ, being a little after the reign of Zedekiah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, after taking Jerusalem and conquering the Jews, carried captive to Babylon. The two books include a space of 427 years. The two books of Chronicles are a history of the same times, and in general of the same persons, by another author. 
for it would be absurd to suppose that the same author wrote the history twice over. The first book of Chronicles, after giving the genealogy from Adam to Saul, which takes up the first nine chapters, begins with the reign of David and the last book ends as in the last book of Kings, soon after the reign of Zedekiah, about 588 years before Christ. The two last verses of the last chapter bring the history forward 52 years more, that is, to 536. But these verses do not belong to the book, as I shall show when I come to speak of the book of Ezra. The two books of Kings, besides the history of Saul, David and Solomon, who reigned over all Israel, contain an abstract of the lives of 17 kings and one queen, who were styled kings of Judah, and of 19, who were styled kings of Israel, for the Jewish nation, immediately. On the death of Solomon, split into two parties, who chose separate kings, and who carried on most rancorous wars against each other. These two books are little more than a history of assassinations, treachery and wars. The cruelties that the Jews had accustomed themselves to practice on the Canaanites, whose country they had savagely invaded under a pretended gift from God, they afterward practiced as furiously on each other. Scarcely half their kings died a natural death, and in some instances whole families were destroyed to secure possession to the successor, who, after a few years, and sometimes only a few months or less, shared the same fate. In the tenth chapter of the second book of Kings, an account is given of two baskets full of children's heads, seventy in number being exposed at the entrance of the city, they were the children of Ahab, and were murdered by the order of Jehu, whom Elisha, the pretended man of God, had anointed to be king over Israel, on purpose to commit this bloody deed, and assassinate his predecessor. And in the account of the reign of Menachem, one of the kings of Israel who had murdered Shalom, who had reigned but one month, it is said, 2 Kings, chap. 15. Ver. 16 that Menahem smote the city of Tifsa, because they opened not the city to him, and all the women therein that were with child he ripped up. Could we permit ourselves to suppose that the Almighty would distinguish any nation of people by the name of his chosen people, we must suppose that people to have been an example to all the rest of the world of the purest piety and humanity, and not such a nation of ruffians and cutthroats as the ancient Jews were, a people who, corrupted by and copying after such monsters and impostors as Moses and Aaron, Joshua, Samuel and David, had distinguished themselves above all others on the face of the known earth for barbarity and wickedness. If we will not stubbornly shut our eyes and steal our hearts, it is impossible not to see, in spite of all that. Long-established superstition imposes upon the mind, that the flattering appellation of his chosen people is no other than a lie which the priests and leaders of the Jews had invented to cover the baseness of their own characters, and which Christian priests, sometimes as corrupt and often as cruel, have professed to believe. The two books of Chronicles are a repetition of the same crimes, but the history is broken in several places by the author leaving out the reign of some of their kings. And in this, as well as in that of kings, there is such a frequent transition from kings of Judah to kings of Israel, and from kings of Israel to kings of Judah, that the narrative is obscure in the reading. In the same book the history sometimes contradicts itself. For example, in the second book of Kings, chap. I. Ver. 17, we are told, but in rather ambiguous terms, that after the death of Ahaziah, king of Israel, Jehoram, or Joram, who was of the house of Ahab, reigned in his stead, in the second year of Jehoram or Joram, son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. And in chap. 8. Ver. 16, of the same book, it is said, and in. The fifth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat being then king of Judah, began to reign, that is, one chapter says Joram of Judah began to reign in the second year of Joram of Israel. And the other chapter says, that Joram of Israel began to reign in the fifth year of Joram of Judah. Several of the most extraordinary matters related in one history, as having happened during the reign of such and such of their kings, are not to be found in the other, in relating the reign of the same king. For example, the two first rival kings, after the death of Solomon, were Rehoboam and Jeroboam, and in I. Kings, chap. 12 and 13, an account is given of Jeroboam making an offering of burnt incense, and that a man, who was there called a man of God, cried out against the altar, chap. 13. Ver. 2, O altar, altar. Thus, saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, 
and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. Verse 4, And it came to pass, when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand which he put out against him dried up, so that he could not pull it in again to him. One would think that such an extraordinary case as this, which is spoken of as a judgment, happening to the chief of one of the parties, and that at the first moment of the separation of the Israelites into two nations, would, if it had been true, have been recorded in both histories. But though men in latter times have believed all that the prophets have said unto him, it does not appear that these prophets or historians believed each other. They knew each other too well. A long account also is given in Kings about Elijah. It runs through several chapters, and concludes with telling, Illinois. Kings, chap. 2. Ver. 2, and it came to pass, as they, Elijah and Elisha, still went on, and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Hum. This the author of Chronicles, miraculous as the story is, makes no mention of, though he mentions Elijah by name. Neither does he say anything of the story related in the second chapter of the same book of Kings, of a parcel of children calling Elisha bald head, bald head, and that this man of God, verse 24, turned back, and looked on them, and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she bears out of the wood, and tore forty and two children of them. He also passes over in silence the story told, too. Kings, chap. 13. That when they were burying a man in the sepulchre where Elisha had been buried, it happened that the dead man, as they were letting him down, ver. 21, touched the bones of Elisha, and he, the dead man, revived, and stood upon his feet. The story does not tell us whether they buried the man, notwithstanding he revived and stood upon his feet, or drew him up again. Upon all these stories the writer of Chronicles is as silent as any writer of the present day who did not choose to be accused of lying, or at least of romancing, would be about stories of the same kind. But, however these two historians may differ from each other with respect to the tales related by either, they are silent alike with respect to those men-styled prophets, whose writings fill up the latter part of the Bible. Isaiah, who lived in the time of Hezekiah, is mentioned in Kings, and again in Chronicles when these historians are speaking of that reign. But, except in one or two instances at most, and those very slightly, none of the rest are so much as spoken of, or even their existence hinted at. Although, according to the Bible chronology, they lived within the time those histories were written. Some of their long before. If those prophets, as they are called, were men of such importance in their day as the compilers of the Bible and priests and commentators have, since represented them to be, how can it be accounted for that not one of these histories should say anything about them? The history in the books of Kings and of Chronicles is brought forward, as I have already said, to the year 588 before Christ. It will, therefore, be proper to examine which of these prophets lived before that period. Here follows a table of all the prophets, with the times in which they lived before Christ, according to the chronology affixed to the first chapter of each of the books of the prophets and also of the number of years they lived before the books of Kings and Chronicles were written. Table of the Prophets Names Years Years before Observations Before Kings and Christ Chronicles Isaiah 760 172. Mentioned. Jeremiah. 629. 41. Mentioned only in the last chap of Kron. Ezekiel. 595. 7. Not mentioned. Daniel. 607. 19. Not mentioned. Hosea 785 97 Not mentioned Joel 800 212 Not mentioned Amos 789 199 
Not mentioned. Obadiah. 789. 199. Not mentioned. Jonah. 862. 274. See the note. Asterisk. Micah. 750. 162. Not mentioned. Nahum. 713. 125. Not mentioned. Habakkuk. 620. 38. Not mentioned. Zephaniah. 630. 42. Not mentioned. Haggai, after the year of 588. Zechariah after the year of 588. Malachi, after the year of 588. Asterisk in 2. Kings, chap. 14. Verse 25, the name of Jonah is mentioned on account of the restoration of a tract of land by Jeroboam. But nothing further is said of him, nor is any allusion made to the book of Jonah, nor to his expedition to Nineveh, nor to his encounter with the whale. This table is either not very honorable for the Bible historians, or not very honorable for the Bible prophets. And I leave to priests and commentators, who are very learned in little things, to settle the point of etiquette between the two, and to assign a reason why the authors of Kings and Chronicles have treated those prophets whom, in the former part of the Age of Reason, I have considered as poets, with as much degrading silence as any historian of the present day would treat Peter Pindar. I have one observation more to make on the book of Chronicles, after which I shall pass on to review the remaining books of the Bible. In my observations on the book of Genesis, I have quoted a passage from the 36th chapter, verse 31, which evidently refers to a time after kings begin to reign over the children of Israel. And I have shown that as this verse is verbatim the same as in Chronicles. Chap. I, verse 43, where it stands consistently with the order of history, which in Genesis it does not that the verse in Genesis, and a great part of the 36th chapter, have been taken from Chronicles, and that the book of Genesis, though it is placed first in the Bible, and ascribed to Moses, has been manufactured by some unknown person after the book of Chronicles was written, which was not until at least 860 years after the time of Moses. The evidence I proceed by to substantiate this is regular and has in it but two stages. First, as I have already stated that the Passage in Genesis refers itself for a time to Chronicles. Secondly, that the book of Chronicles, to which this passage refers itself, was not begun to be written until at least 860 years after the time of Moses. To prove this, we have only to look into the 13th verse of the third chapter of the first book of Chronicles, where the writer, in giving the genealogy of the descendants of David, mentions Zedekiah. And it was in the time of Zedekiah that Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem. 588 years before Christ and consequently more than 860 years after Moses. Those who have superstitiously boasted of the antiquity of the Bible, and particularly of the books ascribed to Moses, have done it without examination, and without any authority than that of one credulous man telling it to another. For so far as historical and chronological evidence applies, the very first book in the Bible is not so ancient as the book of Homer by more than 300 years, and is about the same age with Aesop's fables. I am not contending for the morality of Homer. On the contrary, I think it a book of false glory, tending to inspire immoral and mischievous notions of honor. And with respect to Aesop, though the moral is in general just, the fable is often cruel. And the cruelty of the fable does more injury to the heart, especially in a child, than the moral does good to the judgment. Having now dismissed Kings and Chronicles, I come to the next in course, the Book of Ezra. As one proof, among others I shall produce, to show the disorder. In which this pretended word of God, the Bible, has been put together, and the uncertainty of who the authors were, we have only to look at the three first verses in Ezra, and the last two in Chronicles. For by what kind of cutting and shuffling has it been that the three first verses in Ezra should be the two last verses in Chronicles, or that? The two last in Chronicles should be the three first in Ezra? Hither the authors did not know their own works, or the compilers did not know the authors. The last verse in Chronicles is broken abruptly, and end in the middle of the phrase with the word up, without signifying to what place. This abrupt break, and the appearance of the same verses in different books, 
show, as I have already said, the disorder and ignorance in which the Bible has been put together, and that the compilers of it have no authority for what they were doing, nor we any authority for believing what they have done. Asterisk. Two last verses of Chronicles. Ver. 22. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord, spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah, might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, 23. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him an house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord is God be with him, and let him go up. Three first verses of Ezra. Ver. 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord, by the mouth of Jeremiah, might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of earth, and he hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. Asterisk I observed, as I passed along, several broken and senseless passages in the Bible, without thinking them of consequence enough to be introduced in the body of the work, such as that, I, Samuel, chap, 13, ver, 1, where it is said, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him three thousand men, ampersand C. The first part of verse, that Saul reigned one year, has no sense, since it does not tell us what Saul did, nor say anything of what happened at the end of that one year. And it is, besides, mere absurdity to say he reigned one year, when the very next phrase says he had reigned two. For if he had reigned two, it was impossible not to have reigned one. Another instance occurs in Joshua, chap. V where the writer tells us a story of an angel for such the table of contents at the head of the chapter calls him appearing unto Joshua, and the story ends abruptly and without any conclusion. The story is as follows, verse 13, And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? Verse 14, And he said, Nay, but as captain of the hosts of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth, and did worship, and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? Verse 15, And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou standest is holy. And Joshua did so. And what then? Nothing, for here the story ends, and the chapter 2. Either the story is broken off in the middle, or it is a story told by some Jewish humorist, in ridicule of Joshua's pretended mission from God. And the compilers of the Bible, not perceiving the design of the story, have told it as a serious matter. As a story of humor and ridicule it is a great deal of point, for it pompously introduces an angel in the figure of a man, with a drawn sword in his hand, before whom Joshua falls on his face to the earth and worships which is contrary to their second commandment. And then this most important embassy from heaven ends in telling Joshua to pull off his shoe. It might as well have told him to pull up his breeches. It is certain, however, that the Jews did not credit everything their leaders told them, as appears from the cavalier manner in which they speak of Moses, when he was gone into the mount. As for this Moses, say they, we want not what has become of him. X. Chap. XXXII. Ver. I. The only thing that has any appearance of certainty in the book of Ezra, is the time in which it was written, which was immediately after the return of the Jews from the Babylonian captivity, about 536 years before Christ. Ezra, who, according to the Jewish commentators, is the same person as is called Zdras in the Apocrypha, was one of the persons who returned, and who, it is probable, wrote the account of that affair. Nehemiah, whose book follows next to Ezra, was another of the returned persons and who, it is also probable, wrote the account of the same affair in the book. That bears his name. But these accounts are nothing to us, 
nor to any other persons, unless it be to the Jews, as a part of the history of their nation. And there is just as much of the word of God in those books as there is in any of the histories of France, or Rapin's history of England, or the history of any other country. But even in matters of historical record, neither of those writers are to be depended upon. In the second chapter of Ezra, the writer gives a list of the tribes and families, and of the precise number of souls of each, that returned from Babylon to Jerusalem, and this enrollment of the persons so returned appears to have been one of the principal objects for writing the book. But in this there is an error that destroys the intention of the undertaking. The writer begins his enrollment in the following manner, chap. 2. Ver. 3, the children of Parash, 2870, and 2. Ver. 4, the children of Shepesha, 370 and 2. And in this manner he proceeds through all the families. And in the 64th verse, he makes a total, and says, the whole congregation together was forty and two thousand three hundred and three score. But whoever will take the trouble of casting up the several particulars will find that the total is but twenty nine thousand eight hundred and eighteen, so that the error is twelve thousand five hundred and forty two. Asterisk. What certainty, then, can there be in the Bible for anything? Asterisk particulars of the families from the second chapter of Ezra. Chap. 2. Brought forward. 12,243 15,953 24,144 Verse 3 2,172 Verse 14 2,056 Verse 25 743 Verse 36 973 4 372 15 454 26 621 37 1052 5 775 16 98 27 122 38 1247 6 2812 17 323 28 223 39 1017 7 1254 18 112 29 52 40 74 8 945 19 223 30 156 41 128 9 760 20 95 31 1254 42 139 10 642 21 123 32 320 53 392 11 623 22 56 33 725 60 652 12 1222 23 128 34 345 13 666 24 42 35 3630 Group of dashes Line of dashes Line of dashes Line of dashes 12243 15953 
24,144. Total 29,818. Nehemiah, in like manner, gives a list of the return families, and of the number of each family. He begins, as in Ezra, by saying, Chap. 7. Ver. 8, the children of Parash, 2,100. 7 and 2, and so on through all the families. The list differs in several of the particulars from that of Ezra. In the 66th verse, Nehemiah makes a total, and says, as Ezra has said, the whole congregation together was forty and two thousand three hundred and three score. But the particulars of this list makes a total of but thirty one thousand and eighty nine, so that the error here is eleven thousand two hundred and seventy one. These writers may do well enough for Bible makers, but not for anything where truth and exactness is necessary. The next book in course is the book of Esther. If Madame Esther thought it any honor to offer herself as a kept mistress to Ahasuerus, or as a rival to Queen Vashti, who had refused to come to a drunken king in the midst of a drunken company, to be made a show of, for the account says they had been drinking seven days and were merry, let Esther and Mordecai look to that. It is no business of ours, at least it is none of mine. Besides which the story has a great deal the appearance of being fabulous, and is also anonymous. I pass on to the book of Job. The book of Job differs in character from all the books we have hither to pass over. Treachery and murder make no part of this book. It is the meditations of a mind strongly impressed with the vicissitudes of human life, and by turns sinking under, and struggling against the pressure. It is a highly wrought composition, between willing submission and involuntary discontent, and shows man, as he sometimes is, more disposed to be resigned than he is capable of being. Patience is but a small share in the character of the person of whom the book treats. On the contrary, his grief is often impetuous, but he still endeavors to keep a guard upon it, and seems determined in the midst of accumulating ills, to impose upon himself the hard duty of contentment. I have spoken in a respectful manner of the book of Job in the former part of the Age of Reason, but without knowing at that time what I have learned since, which is, that from all the evidence that can be collected the book of Job does not belong to the Bible. I have seen the opinion of two Hebrew commentators, Aben Ezra and Spinoza, upon this subject. They both say that the book of Job carries no internal evidence of being a Hebrew book. That the genius of the composition and the drama of the piece are not Hebrew. That it has been translated from another language into Hebrew, and that the author of the book was a Gentile. That the character represented under the name of Satan, which is the first and only time this name is mentioned in the Bible does not correspond to any Hebrew idea, and that the two convocations which the deity is supposed to have made of those whom the poem calls sons of God, and the familiarity which this supposed Satan is stated to have with the deity, are in the same case. It may also be observed, that the book shows itself to be the production of a mind cultivated in science, which the Jews, so far from being famous for, were very ignorant of. The allusions to objects of natural philosophy are frequent and strong, and are of a different cast to anything in the books known to be Hebrew. The astronomical names, Pleiades, Orion, and Arcturus, are Greek and not Hebrew names, and it does not appear from anything that is to be found in the Bible, that the Jews knew anything of astronomy or that they studied it. They had no translation of those names into their own language, but adopted the names as they found them in the poem. That the Jews did translate the literary productions of the Gentile nations into the Hebrew language, and mix them with their own is not a matter of doubt. The thirty-first chapter of Proverbs is an evidence of this. It is there said, v. i. the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. This verse stands as a preface to the Proverbs that follow, and which are not the Proverbs of Solomon, but of Lemuel. And this Lemuel was not one of the kings of Israel, nor of Judah, but of some other country, and consequently a Gentile. The Jews, however, have adopted his Proverbs and as they cannot give any account who the author of the book of Job was, nor how they came by the book, and as it differs in character from the Hebrew writings, and stands totally unconnected with every other book and chapter in the Bible, before it and after it, it has all the circumstantial evidence of being originally a book of the Gentiles. Asterisk. Asterisk the prayer known by the name of Agur's prayer, in the thirtieth chapter of Proverbs, immediately preceding the Proverbs of Lemuel, and which is the only sensible, well-conceived and well-expressed prayer in the Bible, has much the appearance of being a prayer taken from the Gentiles. The name of Agur occurs on no other occasion than this. And he is introduced, 
together with the prayer ascribed to him, in the same manner, and nearly in the same words, that Lemuel and his Proverbs are introduced in the chapter that follows. The first verse of the thirtieth chapter says, The words of Agur, the son of Jacob, even the prophecy. Here the word prophecy is used in the same application it is in the following chapter of Lemuel, unconnected with anything of prediction. The prayer of Agur is in the eighth and ninth verses, Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal, and take the name of my God in vain. This is not any of the marks of being a Jewish prayer, for the Jews never prayed but when they were in trouble, and never for anything but victory, vengeance and riches. The Bible makers and those regulators of time, the chronologists, appear to have been at a loss where to place and how to dispose of the book of Job, for it contains no one historical circumstance, nor allusion to any, that might determine its place in the Bible. But it would not have answered the purpose of these men to have informed the world of their ignorance, and therefore, they have affixed it to the era of 1520 years before Christ, which is during the time the Israelites were in Egypt, and for which they have just as much authority and no more than I should have for saying it was a thousand years before that period. The probability, however, is that it is older than any book in the Bible, and it is the only one that can be read without indignation or disgust. We know nothing of what the ancient Gentile world, as it is called, was before the time of the Jews, whose practice has been to calumniate and blacken the character of all other nations. And it is from the Jewish accounts that we have learned to call them heathens. But, as far as we know to the contrary, they were just a mortal people, and not addicted, like the Jews, to cruelty and revenge, but of whose profession of faith we are unacquainted. It appears to have been their custom to personify both virtue and vice by statues and images, as is done nowadays both by statuary and by painting. But it does not follow from this that they worshipped them, any more than we do. I pass on to the book of Psalms, of which it is not necessary to make much observation. Some of them are moral, and others are very revengeful. And the greater part relates to certain local circumstances of the Jewish nation at the time they were written, with which we have nothing to do. It is, however, an error or an imposition to call them the Psalms of David. They are a collection, as song books are nowadays, from different song writers, who lived at different times. The 137th Psalm could not have been written till more than 400 years after the time of David, because it was written in commemoration of an event, the captivity of the Jews in Babylon, which did not happen till that distance of time. By the rivers of Babylon we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows, in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. As a man would say to an American, or to a Frenchman, or to an Englishman, Sing us one of your American songs, or of your French songs, or of your English songs. This remark, with respect to the time this psalm was written, is of no other use than to show, among others already mentioned, the general imposition the world has been under in respect to the authors of the Bible. No regard has been paid to time, place and circumstance, and the names of persons have been affixed to the several books, which it was as impossible they should write as that a man should walk in procession at his own funeral. The Book of Proverbs. These, like the Psalms, are a collection, and that from authors belonging to other nations than those of the Jewish nation, as I have shown in the observations upon the book of Job, besides which some of the Proverbs ascribed to Solomon did not appear till two hundred and fifty years after the death of Solomon. For it is said in the first verse of the twenty-fifth chapter, These are also Proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. It was two hundred and fifty years from the time of Solomon to the time of Hezekiah, when a man is famous and his name is abroad, he is made the putative father of things he never said or did, and this, most probably, has been the case with Solomon. It appears to have been the fashion of that day to make proverbs, as it is now to make jest books and father them upon those who never saw them. The book of Ecclesiastes, or the preacher, is also ascribed to Solomon, and that with much reason, if not with truth. It is written as the solitary reflections of a worn-out debauchee, such as Solomon was, who, looking back on scenes he could no longer enjoy, cries out, all is vanity. A great deal of the metaphor and of the sentiment is obscure, most probably by translation. 
but enough is left to show they were strongly pointed in the original. Asterisk. From what is transmitted to us of the character of Solomon, he was witty, ostentatious, dissolute, and at last melancholy. He lived fast, and died, tired of the world, at the age of fifty-eight years. Asterisk those that look out of the window shall be darkened, is an obscure figure in translation for loss of sight. Seven hundred wives and three hundred concubines are worse than none, and, however it may carry with it the appearance of heightened enjoyment, it defeats all the felicity of affection by leaving it no point to fix upon. Divided love is never happy. This was the case with Solomon, and if he could not, with all his pretensions to wisdom, discover it beforehand, he merited, unpitted, the mortification he afterward endured. In this point of view, his preaching is unnecessary, because, to know the consequences, it is only necessary to know the cause. Seven hundred wives, and three hundred concubines would have stood in place of the whole book. It was needless, after this, to say that all was vanity and vexation of spirit. For it is impossible to derive happiness from the company of those whom we deprive of happiness. To be happy in old age, it is necessary that we accustom ourselves to objects that can accompany the mind all the way through life, and that we take the rest as good in our day. The mere man of pleasure is miserable in old age, and the mere drudge in business is but little better. Whereas, natural philosophy, mathematical and mechanical science, are a continual source of tranquil pleasure, and in spite of the gloomy dogmas of priests and of superstition, the study of these things is the true theology. It teaches man to know and to admire the Creator, for the principles of science are in the creation, and are unchangeable and of divine origin. Those who knew Benjamin Franklin will recollect that his mind was ever young, his temper ever serene. Science, that never grows gray, was always his mistress. He was never without an object, for when we cease to have an object, we become like an invalid in a hospital waiting for death. Solomon's songs are amorous and foolish enough, but which wrinkled fanaticism has called divine. The compilers of the Bible have placed these songs after the book of Ecclesiastes, and the chronologists have affixed to them the era of 1014 years before Christ, at which time Solomon, according to the same chronology, was 19 years of age, and was then forming his seraglio of wives and concubines. The Bible makers and the chronologists should have managed this matter a little better, and either have said nothing about the time, or chosen a time less inconsistent with the supposed divinity of those songs. For Solomon was then in the honeymoon of one thousand debaucheries. It should also have occurred to them that, as he wrote, if he did write, the book of Ecclesiastes long after these songs, and in which he exclaims, that all is vanity and vexation of spirit, that he included those songs in that description. This is the more probable, because he says, or somebody for him, Ecclesiastes, chap. 2. Ver. 8. I got me men singers and women singers most probably to sing those songs, as musical instruments and dead of all sorts. And behold, ver. 2. All was vanity and vexation of spirit. The compilers, however, have done their work but by halves, for as they have given us the songs, they should have given us the tunes, that we might sing them. The books called the books of the prophets fill up all the remaining parts of the Bible. They are sixteen in number, beginning with Isaiah, and ending with Malachi, of which I have given you a list in my observations upon Chronicles. Of these sixteen prophets, all of whom, except the three last, lived within the time the books of Kings and Chronicles were written, two only, Isaiah and Jeremiah, are mentioned in the history of those books. I shall begin with those two reserving what I have to say on the general character of the men called prophets to another part of the work. Whoever will take the trouble of reading the book ascribed to Isaiah will find it one of the most wild and disorderly compositions ever put together. It is neither beginning, middle, nor end. And, except a short historical part and a few sketches of history in two or three of the first chapters, is one continued, incoherent, bombastic rout, full of extravagant metaphor, without application, and destitute of meaning. A schoolboy would scarcely have been excusable for writing such stuff. It is, at least in the translation, that kind of composition and false taste that is properly called prose run mad. The historical part begins at the 36th chapter, and is continued to the end of the 39th chapter. It relates to some matters that are said to have passed during the reign of Hezekiah, king of Judah, at which time Isaiah lived. This fragment of history begins and ends abruptly, it has not the least connection with the chapter that precedes it, nor with that which follows it, nor with any other in the book. 
It is probable that Isaiah wrote this fragment himself, because he was an actor in the circumstances it treats of. But, except this part, there are scarcely two chapters that have any connection with each other. One is entitled, at the beginning of the first verse, The Burden of Babylon. Another, The Burden of Moab. Another, The Burden of Damascus. Another, The Burden of Egypt. Another, The Burden of the Desert of the Sea. Another, The Burden of the Valley of Vision. Asterisk dash as you would say, The Story of the Night of the Burning Mountain. The Story of Cinderella, or, The Children in the Wood, etc. Etc. Asterisk C beginning of chapters 13, 15, 17, 19, 21 and XXII. I have already shown, in the instance of the two last verses of Chronicles, and the three first in Ezra, that the compilers of the Bible mixed and confounded the writings of different authors with each other, which alone, were there no other cause, is sufficient to destroy the authenticity of any compilation because it is more than presumptive evidence that the compilers were ignorant who the authors were. A very glaring instance of this occurs in the book ascribed to Isaiah, the latter part of the 44th chapter and the beginning of the 45th, so far from having been written by Isaiah, could only have been written by some person who lived at least a hundred and fifty years after Isaiah was dead. These chapters are a compliment to Cyrus, who permitted the Jews to return to Jerusalem from the Babylonian captivity to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple, as is stated in Ezra. The last verse of the 44th chapter and the beginning of the 45th, are in the following words, that saith of Cyrus, He is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two-leaved gates and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee, etc. What audacity of church and priestly ignorance it is to impose this book upon the world is the writing of Isaiah, when Isaiah, according to their own chronology, died soon after the death of Hezekiah, which was 693 years before Christ, and the decree of Cyrus, in favor of the Jews returning to Jerusalem, was, according to the same chronology, 536 years before Christ which is a distance of time between the two of 162 years. I do not suppose that the compilers of the Bible made these books, but rather that they picked up some loose anonymous essays, and put them together under the names of such authors as best suited their purpose. They have encouraged the imposition, which is next to inventing it, for it was impossible, but they must have observed it. When we see the studied craft of the scripture makers, in making every part of this romantic book of schoolboy's eloquence bend to the monstrous idea of a son of God begotten by a ghost on the body of a virgin, there is no imposition we are not justified in suspecting. The Muff Every phrase and circumstance is marked with the barbarous hand of superstitious torture, and forced into meanings it was impossible they could have. The head of every chapter and the top of every page are blazoned with the names of Christ and the Church that the unwary reader might suck in the air before he begin to read. Behold a virgin shall conceive, and bear a son, Isaiah, chap. 7. Ver. 14, has been interpreted to mean the person called Jesus Christ, and his mother Mary, and has been echoed through Christendom for more than a thousand years. And such has been the rage of this opinion that scarcely a spot in it but has been stained with blood, and marked with desolation in consequence of it. Though it is not my intention to enter into controversy on subjects of this kind, but to confine myself to show that the Bible is spurious, and thus, by taking away the foundation, to overthrow at once the whole structure of superstition raised thereon, I will, however, stop a moment to expose the fallacious application of this passage. Whether Isaiah was playing a trick with Ahaz, king of Judah, to whom this passage is spoken, is no business of mine. I mean only to show the misapplication of the passage and that it has no more reference to Christ and his mother than it has to me and my mother. The story is simply this, the king of Syria and the king of Israel, I have already mentioned that the Jews were split into two nations, one of which was called Judah, the capital of which was Jerusalem, and the other Israel, made war jointly against Ahaz, king of Judah, and marched their armies toward Jerusalem. Ahaz and his people became alarmed, and the account says, verse 2, and his heart was moved and the heart of his people, as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. In this situation of things, Isaiah addresses himself to Ahaz, and assures him in the name of the Lord the cant phrase of all the prophets that these two kings should not succeed against him.
and to satisfy has that this should be the case, tells him to ask a sign. This, the account says, Ahaz declined doing, giving as a reason that he would not tempt the Lord upon which Isaiah, who is the speaker, says, Ver. 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And the sixteenth verse says, For before this child shall know to refuse the evil, and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest, or dreadest, meaning Syria and the kingdom of Israel, shall be forsaken of both her kings. Here then was the sign, and the time limited for the completion of the assurance or promise, namely, before this child should know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Isaiah having committed himself thus far, it became necessary to him, in order to avoid the imputation of being a false prophet and the consequence thereof, to take measures to make this sign appear. It certainly was not a difficult thing, in any time of the world, to find a girl with child, or to make her so, and perhaps Isaiah knew of one beforehand. For I do not suppose that the prophets of that day were any more to be trusted than the priests of this. Be that, however, as it may, he says in the next chapter, ver. 2, And I took unto me faithful witnesses to record, Ariah the priest, and Zechariah the son of Jeberechiah, and I went unto the prophetess, and she conceived and bare a son. Here, then, is the whole story, foolish as it is, of this child and this virgin. And it is upon the Barephus perversion of this story, that the book of Matthew, and the impudence and sordid interests of priests in later times, have founded a theory which they call the Gospel, and have applied this story to signify the person they call Jesus Christ, begotten, they say, by a ghost, whom they call Holly, on the body of a woman, engaged in marriage, and afterward married, whom they call a virgin, seven hundred years after this foolish story was told. A theory which, speaking for myself, I hesitate not to disbelieve, and to say, is as fabulous and as false as God is true. Asterisk. Asterisk in the fourteenth verse of the seventh chapter, it is said that the child should be called Immanuel. But this name was not given to either of the children otherwise than as a character which the word signifies. That of the prophetess was called Maher Shalal Hashbaz, and that of Mary was called Jesus. But to show the imposition and falsehood of Isaiah, we have only to attend to the sequel of this story, which, though it is passed over in silence in the book of Isaiah, is related in the twenty-eighth chapter of the Second Chronicles, and which is, that instead of these two kings failing in their attempt against Ahaz, king of Judah, as Isaiah had pretended to foretell in the name of the Lord, they succeeded. Ahaz was defeated and destroyed, a hundred and twenty thousand of his people were slaughtered, Jerusalem was plundered, and two hundred thousand women, and sons and daughters, carried into captivity. Thus much for this lying prophet and impostor, Isaiah, and the book of falsehoods that bears his name. I pass on to the book of Jeremiah. This prophet, as he is called, lived in the time that Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem, in the reign of Zedekiah, the last king of Judah. And the suspicion was strong against him that he was a traitor in the interests of Nebuchadnezzar. Everything relating to Jeremiah shows him to have been a man of an equivocal character. In his metaphor of the potter and the clay, chap. 18. He guards his prognostications in such a crafty manner as always to leave himself a door to escape by, in case the event should be contrary to what he had predicted. In the seventh and eighth verses of that chapter he makes the Almighty to say, At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation, and concerning a kingdom, to pluck up, and to pull down, and destroy it. If that nation, against whom I have pronounced, turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. Here was a proviso against one side of the case. Now for the other side. Verses 9 and 10, And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation, and concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice. Then I shall repent of the good, wherewith I said I would benefit them. Here is a proviso against the other side. And, according to this plan of prophesying, a prophet could never be wrong, however mistaken the Almighty might be. This sort of absurd subterfuge, and this manner of speaking of the Almighty, as one would speak of a man, is consistent with nothing but the stupidity of the Bible. As to the authenticity of the book, it is only necessary to read it, in order to decide positively that, though some passages recorded therein may have been spoken by Jeremiah, he is not the author of the book. The historical parts, if they can be called by that name, are in the most confused condition.
the same events are several times repeated, and that in a manner different, and sometimes in contradiction to each other. And this disorder runs even to the last chapter, where the history upon which the greater part of the book has been employed begins anew, and ends abruptly. The book has all the appearance of being a medley of unconnected anecdotes respecting persons and things of that time, collected together in the same rude manner as if the various and contradictory accounts that are to be found in a bundle of newspapers respecting persons and things of the present day, were put together without date, order, or explanation. I will give two or three examples of this kind. It appears, from the account of the 37th chapter, that the army of Nebuchadnezzar, which is called the army of the Chaldeans, had besieged Jerusalem some time, and on their hearing that the army of Pharaoh, of Egypt, was marching against them they raised the siege and retreated for a time. It may here be proper to mention, in order to understand this confused history, that Nebuchadnezzar had besieged and taken Jerusalem during the reign of Joachim, the predecessor of Zedekiah, and that it was Nebuchadnezzar who had made Zedekiah king, or rather viceroy, and that this second siege, of which the book of Jeremiah treats, was in consequence of the revolt of Zedekiah against Nebuchadnezzar. This will in some measure account for the suspicion that affixes to Jeremiah of being a traitor and in the interest of Nebuchadnezzar, whom Jeremiah calls, in the 43rd chapter, ver. 10, the servant of God. The 11th verse of this chapter, the 37th, says, And it came to pass, that, when the army of the Chaldeans was broken up from Jerusalem, for fear of Pharaoh's army, that Jeremiah went forth out of Jerusalem, to go, as this account states, into the land of Benjamin to separate himself thence in the midst of the people, and when he was in the gate of Benjamin, a captain of the ward was there, whose name was Irijah, the son of Shelemiah, the son of Hananiah, and he took Jeremiah the prophet, saying, Thou fallest away to the Chaldeans. Then said Jeremiah, It is false. I fall not away to the Chaldeans. Jeremiah being thus stopped and accused, was, after being examined, committed to prison on suspicion of being a traitor, where he remained, as is stated in the last verse of this chapter. But the next chapter gives an account of the imprisonment of Jeremiah which has no connection with this account, but ascribes his imprisonment to another circumstance, and for which we must go back to the twenty-first chapter. It is there stated, ver. 1, that Zedekiah sent Pasher, the son of Malkiah, and Zephaniah, the son of Messiah the priest, to Jeremiah to inquire of him concerning Nebuchadnezzar, whose army was then before Jerusalem. And Jeremiah said unto them, Ver. 8 and 9, Thus saith the Lord, Behold I set before you the way of life, and the way of death. He that abideth in this city shall die. By the sword, and by the famine, and by the pestilence. But he that goeth out and falleth to the Chaldeans that besiege you, he shall live, and his life shall be unto him for a prey. This interview and conference breaks off abruptly at the end of the tenth verse of the twenty-first chapter. And such is the disorder of this book that we have to pass over sixteen chapters, upon various subjects, in order to come at the continuation and event of this conference, and this brings us to the first verse of the thirty-eighth chapter, as I have just mentioned. The thirty-eighth chapter opens with saying, Then Shepesha, the son of Matan, Dalia, the son of Pasher, and Jekyll, the son of Shalemiah, and Pasher, the son of Malkiah. Here are more persons mentioned than in the twenty-first chapter heard the words that Jeremiah had spoken unto all the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, He that remaineth in this city, shall die by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. But he that goeth forth to the Chaldeans shall live, for he shall have his life for prey, and shall live. Which are the words of the conference, therefore, they say to Zedekiah, We beseech thee, let us put this man to death, for thus he weakeneth the hands of the men of war that remain in this city, and the hands of all the people in speaking such words unto them. For this man seeketh not the welfare of the people, but the hurt. And at the sixth verse it is said, Then took they Jeremiah, and cast him into the dungeon of Malkiah. These two accounts are different and contradictory. The one ascribes his imprisonment to his attempt to escape out of the city, the other to his preaching and prophesying in the city, the one to his being seized by the guard at the gate, the other to his being accused before Zedekiah, by the conferees. Asterisk. Asterisk I observed two chapters, 16th and 17th, in the first book of Samuel, that contradict each other with respect to David, and the manner he became acquainted with Saul. As the 37th and 38th chapters of the book of Jeremiah contradict each other with respect to the cause of Jeremiah's imprisonment. 
In the sixteenth chapter of Samuel, it is said, that an evil spirit of God troubled Saul, and that his servants advised him as a remedy, to seek out the man who was a cunning player upon the harp. And Saul said, verse 17, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants, and said, Behold I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse, and said, Send me David thy son. And, verse 21, David came to Saul, and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor-bearer. And when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, verse 23, that David took an harp, and played with his hand, so Saul was refreshed, and was well. But the next chapter, 17, gives an account, all different to this, of the manner that Saul and David became acquainted. Here it is ascribed to David's encounter with Goliath, when David was sent by his father to carry provision to his brethren in the camp. In the 55th verse of this chapter it is said, And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, Goliath, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. And the king said, Enquire thou whose son the stripling is. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him, and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son art thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant Jesse the Bethlehemite. These two accounts belie each other, because each of them supposes Saul and David not to have known each other before. This book, the Bible is too ridiculous even for criticism. In the next chapter, the 39th, we have another instance of the disordered state of this book. For notwithstanding the siege of the city by Nebuchadnezzar has been the subject of several of the preceding chapters, particularly the 37th and 38th, the 39th chapter begins as if not a word had been said upon the subject, and as if the reader was to be informed of every particular concerning it, for it begins with saying, verse it, in the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army, against Jerusalem, and they besieged it, etc. But the instance in the last chapter, the 52nd, is still more glaring, for though the story has been told over and over again, this chapter still supposes the reader not to know anything of it, for it begins by saying, Ver. 1. Zedekiah was one and twenty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned eleven years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. Ver. 4. And it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, in the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his army, against Jerusalem, and pitched against it, and built forts against it, etc. It is not possible that any one man, and more particularly Jeremiah, could have been the writer of this book. The errors are such as could not have been committed by any person sitting down to compose a work. Were I, or any other man, to write in such a disordered manner, nobody would read what was written. And everybody would suppose that the writer was in a state of insanity. The only way, therefore, to account for this disorder is, that the book is a medley of detached, unauthenticated anecdotes, put together by some stupid bookmaker, under the name of Jeremiah, because many of them refer to him and to the circumstances of the times he lived in. Of the duplicity, and of the false prediction of Jeremiah, I shall mention two instances, and then proceed to review the remainder of the Bible. It appears from the 38th chapter, that when Jeremiah was in prison, Zedekiah sent for him, and at this interview, which was private, Jeremiah pressed it strongly on Zedekiah to surrender himself to the enemy. If, says he, ver. 17, thou wilt assuredly go forth unto the king of Babylon's princes, then thy soul shall live, etc. Zedekiah was apprehensive that what passed at this conference should be known, and he said to Jeremiah, Ver. 25, If the princes, meaning those of Judah, hear that I have talked with thee, and they come unto thee, and say unto thee, Declare unto us now what thou hast said unto the king. Hide it not from us, and we will not put thee to death, and also what the king said unto thee. Then thou shalt say unto them, I presented my supplication before the king that he would not cause me to return to Jonathan's house to die there. Then came all the princes unto Jeremiah, and asked him, and he told them according to all the words the king had commanded. 
Thus, this man of God, as he is called, could tell a lie or very strongly prevaricate, when he supposed it would answer his purpose. For certainly he did not go to Zedekiah to make his supplication, neither did he make it. He went because he was sent for, and he employed that opportunity to advise Zedekiah to surrender himself to Nebuchadnezzar. In the thirty-fourth chapter is a prophecy of Jeremiah to Zedekiah, in these words, Ver. 2, Thus saith the Lord, Behold I will give this city into the hands of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. And thou shalt not escape out of his hand, but shalt surely be taken, and delivered into his hand. And thine eyes shall behold the eyes of the king of Babylon, and he shall speak with thee mouth to mouth, and thou shalt go to Babylon. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O Zedekiah, king of Judah, thus saith the Lord, of thee, thou shalt not die by the sword, but thou shalt die in peace. And with the burnings of thy fathers, the former kings which were before thee, so shall they burn odors for thee, and they will lament thee, saying, Ah, Lord! For I have pronounced the word, saith the Lord. Now, instead of Zedekiah beholding the eyes of the king of Babylon, and speaking with him mouth to mouth, and dying in peace, and with the burning of odors, as at the funeral of his fathers, as Jeremiah had declared the Lord himself had pronounced, the reverse, according to the fifty-second chapter, was the case. It is there said, Ver. 10, And the king of Babylon slew the son of Zedekiah before his eyes. Then he put out the eyes of Zedekiah, and the king of Babylon bound him in chains, and carried him to Babylon, and put him in prison till the day of his death. What, then? can we say of these prophets, but that they were impostors and liars? As for Jeremiah, he experienced none of those evils. He was taken into favor by Nebuchadnezzar, who gave him in charge to the captain of the guard, chap. XXXIX. Ver. 12. Take him, said he, and look well to him, and do him no harm. But do unto him even as he shall say unto thee. Jeremiah joined himself afterward to Nebuchadnezzar, and went about prophesying for him against the Egyptians, who had marched to the relief of Jerusalem while it was besieged. Thus much for another of the lying prophets, and the book that bears his name. I have been the more particular in treating of the books. Ascribed to Isaiah and Jeremiah, because those two are spoken of in the books of Kings and Chronicles, which the others are not. The remainder of the books ascribed to the men called prophets I shall not trouble myself much about, but take them collectively into the observations I shall offer on the character of the men styled prophets. In the former part of the Age of Reason, I have said that the word prophet was the Bible word for poet, and that the flights and metaphors of Jewish poets have been foolishly erected into what are now called prophecies. I am sufficiently justified in this opinion, not only because the books called the prophecies are written in poetical language, but because there is no word in the Bible, except it be the word prophet, that describes what we mean by a poet. I have also said, that the word signifies a performer upon musical instruments, of which I have given some instances, such as that of a company of prophets prophesying with psalteries, with tabrets, with pipes, with harps, etc. And that Saul prophesied with them, I some Chapix Ver. 5. It appears from this passage, and from other parts in the book of Samuel, that the word prophet was confined to signify poetry and music, for the person who was supposed to have a visionary insight into concealed things, was not a prophet but a seer asterisk. I. Sam. Chap. 9. Ver. 9. And it was not till after the word. Seer went out of use, which most probably was when Saul banished those he called wizards, that the profession of the seer, or the art of seeing, became incorporated into the word prophet. Asterisk I know not what is the Hebrew word that corresponds to the word seer in English, but I observe it is translated into French by la voix, from the verb voir, to see, and which means the person who sees, or the seer. According to the modern meaning of the word prophet and prophesying, it signifies foretelling events to a great distance of time, and it became necessary to the inventors of the gospel to give it this latitude of meaning, in order to apply or to stretch what they call the prophecies of the Old Testament to the times of the New. But according to the Old Testament, the prophesying of the seer, and afterward of the prophet, so far as the meaning of the word seer incorporated into that of prophet, had reference only to things of the time then passing, or very closely connected with it such as the event of a battle they were going to engage in, or of a journey, or of any enterprise they were going to undertake, 
or of any circumstance then pending, or of any difficulty they were then in, all of which had immediate reference to themselves, as in the case already mentioned of Ahaz and Isaiah with respect to the expression, Behold a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and not to any distant future time. It was that kind of prophesying that corresponds to what we call fortune-telling, such as casting nativities, predicting riches, fortunate or unfortunate marriages, conjuring for lost goods, etc. And it is the fraud of the Christian church, not that of the Jews, and the ignorance and the superstition of modern, not that of ancient times, that elevated those poetical, musical, conjuring, dreaming, strolling gentry into the rank they have since had. But, Besides this general character of all the prophets, they had also a particular character. They were in parties, and they prophesied for or against, according to the party they were with, as the poetical and political writers of the present day write in defense of the party they associate with against the other. After the Jews were divided into two nations, that of Judah and that of Israel, each party had its prophets, who abused and accused each other of being false prophets, lying prophets, impostors, etc. The prophets of the party of Judah prophesied against the prophets of the party of Israel, and those of the party of Israel against those of Judah. This party prophesying showed itself immediately on the separation under the first two rival kings, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. The prophet that cursed or prophesied against the altar that Jeroboam had built in Bethel, was of the party of Judah, where Rehoboam was king, and he was waylaid on his return home by a prophet of the party of Israel, who said unto him, I, Kings, chap. 13. Art thou the man of God that came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then the prophet of the party of Israel said to him, I am a prophet also, as thou art signifying of Judah, and an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water, but, says the eighteenth verse, he lied unto him. This event, however, according to the story, is that the prophet of Judah never got back to Judah, for he was found dead on the road, by the contrivance of the prophet of Israel, who, no doubt, was called a true prophet by his own party, and the prophet of Judah a lying prophet. In the third chapter of the second of Kings, a story is related of prophesying or conjuring that shows, in several particulars, the character of a prophet. Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and Jehoram, king of Israel had for a while ceased their party animosity, and entered into an alliance. And these two, together with the king of Edom, engaged in a war against the king of Moab. After uniting and marching their armies, the story says, they were in great distress for water. Upon which Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord, that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the servants of the king of Israel said, Here is Elisha. Elisha was one of the party of Judah. And Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, said, The word of the Lord is with him. The story then says, that these three kings went down to Elisha, who, as I have said, was a Judahite prophet, saw the king of Israel, he said unto him, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father, and to the prophets of thy mother. And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together, to deliver them into the hands of Moab, meaning because of the distress they were in for water. Upon which Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, surely, were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look towards thee, nor see thee. Here is all the venom and vulgarity of a party prophet. We have now to see the performance, or manner of prophesying. Ver. 15. Bring me, said Elisha, a minstrel and it came to pass, when the minstrel played, that the hand of the Lord came upon him. Here is the farce of the conjurer. Now for the prophecy, and Elisha said, singing most probably to the tune he was playing, Thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches, which was just telling them what every countryman could have told them, without either fiddle or farce, that the way to get water was to dig for it. But as every conjurer is not famous alike for the same thing, so neither were those prophets. For though all of them, at least those I have spoken of, were famous for lying, some of them excelled in cursing. Elisha, whom I have just mentioned, was a chief in this branch of prophesying. It was he that cursed the forty-two children in the name of the Lord, whom the two she bears came and devoured. We are to suppose that those children were of the party of Israel. 
but as those who will curse will lie, there is just as much credit to be given to the story of Elisha's two she bears as there is to that of the dragon of Wantley, of whom it is said, Poor children three devoured he, that could not with him grapple. And at once up he ate them up, as a man would eat an apple. There was another description of men called prophets, that amused themselves with dreams and visions. But whether by night or by day we know not. These, if they were not quite harmless, were but little mischievous. Of this class are Hezekiel and Daniel. And the first question upon those books, as upon all the others, is, are they genuine? That is, were they written by Ezekiel and Daniel? Of this there is no proof, but so far as my own opinion goes, I am more inclined to believe they were, than that they were not. My reasons for this opinion are as follows, first, because those books do not contain internal evidence to prove they were not written by Ezekiel and Daniel, as the books ascribed to Moses, Joshua, Samuel, etc. Prove they were not written by Moses, Joshua, Samuel, etc. Secondly, because they were not written till after the Babylonian captivity began, and there is good reason to believe that not any book in the Bible was written before that period, at least. It is provable, from the books themselves, as I have already shown, that they were not written till after the commencement of the Jewish monarchy. Thirdly, because the manner in which the books ascribed to Ezekiel and Daniel are written agrees with the condition these men were in. At the time of writing them, had the numerous commentators and priests, who have foolishly employed or wasted their time in pretending to expound and unrivalled those books, been carried into captivity, as Ezekiel and Daniel were, it would have greatly improved their intellects in comprehending the reason for this mode of writing, and have saved them the trouble of racking their invention, as they have done, to no purpose, for they would have found that themselves would be obliged to write whatever they had to write respecting their own affairs or those of their friends or of their country, in a concealed manner, as those men have done. These two books differ from all the rest for it is only these that are filled with accounts of dreams and visions. And this difference arose from the situation the writers were in as prisoners of war, or prisoners of state, in a foreign country, which obliged them to convey even the most trifling information to each other, and all their political projects or opinions, in obscure and metaphorical terms. The pretend to have dreamed dreams and seen visions, because it was unsafe for them to speak facts or plain language. We ought, however, to suppose that the persons to whom they wrote understood what they meant, and that it was not intended anybody else should. But these busy commentators and priests have been puzzling their wits to find out what it was not intended they should know, and with which they have nothing to do. Ezekiel and Daniel were carried prisoners to Babylon under the first captivity, in the time of Joachim, nine years before the second captivity in the time of Zedekiah. The Jews were then still numerous, and had considerable force at Jerusalem. And as it is natural to suppose that men in the situation of Ezekiel and Daniel would be meditating the recovery of their country and their own deliverance, it is reasonable to suppose that the accounts of dreams and visions with which those books are filled, are no other than a disguised mode of correspondence, to facilitate those objects that serve them as a cipher or secret alphabet. If they are not thus, their tales, reveries, and nonsense, or, at least, a fanciful way of wearing off the wearisomeness of captivity, but the presumption is they were the former. Ezekiel begins his books by speaking of a vision of cherubims and of a wheel within a wheel, which he says he saw by the river Chbar, in the land of his captivity. Is it not reasonable to suppose that by the cherubims he meant the temple of Jerusalem, where they had figures of cherubims, and by a wheel within a wheel, which, as a figure, has always been understood to signify political contrivance, the project or means of recovering Jerusalem? In the latter part of this book, he supposes himself transported to Jerusalem and into the temple, and he refers back to the vision on the river Chbar, and says, chapter Xli, verse 3, that this last vision was like the vision on the river Chbar, which indicates that those pretended dreams and visions had for their object the recovery of Jerusalem, and nothing further. As to the romantic interpretations and applications, while does the dreams and visions they undertake to explain, which commentators and priests have made of those books, that of converting them into things which they call prophecies, and making them bend to times and circumstances as far remote even as the present day, it shows the fraud or the extreme folly to which credulity or priest craft can go. Scarcely anything can be more absurd than to suppose that men situated as Ezekiel and Daniel were, 
whose country was overrun and in the possession of the enemy, all their friends and relations in captivity abroad, or in slavery at home, or massacred, or in continual danger of it. Scarcely anything, I say, can be more absurd, than to suppose that such men should find nothing to do but that of employing their time and their thoughts about what was to happen to other nations a thousand or two thousand years after they were dead. At the same time, nothing is more natural than that they should meditate the recovery of Jerusalem, and their own deliverance, and that this was the sole object of all the obscure and apparently frantic writings contained in those books. In this sense, the mode of writing used in those two books, being forced by necessity, and not adopted by choice, is not irrational. But, if we are to use the books as prophecies, they are false. In the 29th chapter of Ezekiel, speaking of Egypt, it is said, Ver. 2. No foot of man shall pass through it, nor foot of beast shall pass through it. Neither shall it be inhabited for forty years. This is what never came to pass, and consequently it is false, as all the books I have already reviewed are. I here close this part of the subject. In the former part of the Age of Reason I have spoken of Jonah, and of the story of him and the whale. A fit story for ridicule, if it was written to be believed, or of laughter, if it was intended to try what credulity could swallow. For if it could swallow Jonah and a whale, it could swallow anything. But, as is already shown in the observations on the book of Job and of Proverbs, it is not always certain which of the books in the Bible are originally Hebrew, or only translations from the books of the Gentiles into Hebrew. And as the book of Jonah, so far from treating of the affairs of the Jews, says nothing upon that subject, but treats altogether of the Gentiles, it is more probable that it is a book of the Gentiles than of the Jews, and that it has been written as a fable, to expose the nonsense and satirize the vicious and malignant character of a Bible prophet, or a predicting priest. Jonah is represented, first, as a disobedient prophet, running away from his mission, and taking shelter aboard a vessel of the Gentiles, bound from Joppa to Tarshish, as if he ignorantly supposed, by some paltry contrivance, he could hide himself where God could not find him. The vessel is overtaken by a storm at sea, and the mariners, all of whom are Gentiles, believing it to be a judgment, on account of someone on board who had committed a crime, agreed to cast lots to discover the offender, and the lot fell upon Jonah. But, before this, they had cast all their wares and merchandise overboard to lighten the vessel, while Jonah, like a stupid fellow, was fast asleep in the hold. After the lot had designated Jonah to be the offender, they questioned him to know who and what he was, and he told them he was a Hebrew. And the story implies that he confessed himself to be guilty. But these Gentiles, instead of sacrificing him at once, without pity or mercy, as a company of Bible prophets or priests would have done by a Gentile in the same case, and as it is related Samuel had done by a gag and Moses by the women and children, they endeavored to save him, though at the risk of their own lives, for the account says, nevertheless, that is, Though Jonah was a Jew and a foreigner, and the cause of all their misfortunes and the loss of their cargo, the men rowed hard to bring it, the boat, to land, but they could not for the sea rot, and was tempestuous against them. Still, they were unwilling to put the fate of the lot into execution, and they cried, says the account, unto the Lord, saying, V. 14. We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood. For thou, O Lord, hast done as it pleased thee. Meaning, thereby, that they did not presume to judge Jonah guilty, since that he might be innocent. But that they considered the lot that had fallen to him as a decree of God, or as it pleased God. The address of this prayer shows that the Gentiles worshipped one supreme being, and that they were not idolaters, as the Jews represented them to be. But the Storm still continuing, and the danger increasing, they put the fate of the lot into execution, and cast Jonah into the sea, where, according to the story, a great fish swallowed him up all and alive. We have now to consider Jonah securely housed from the storm in the fisher's belly. Here we are told that he prayed. But the prayer is a made-up prayer, taken from various parts of the Psalms, without any connection or consistency, and adapted to the distress, but not at all to the condition that Jonah was in. It is such a prayer as a Gentile, who might know something of the Psalms, could copy out for him. This circumstance alone, were there no other, is sufficient to indicate that the whole is a made-up story. The prayer, 
however, is supposed to have answered the purpose, and the story goes on, taking up at the same time the cant language of a Bible prophet, saying, Chap. 2, Ver. 10, And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Jonah then received a second mission to Nineveh, with which he sets out. And we have now to consider him as a preacher. The distress he is represented to have suffered, the remembrance of his own disobedience as the cause of it, and the miraculous escape he's supposed to have had, were sufficient, one would conceive, to have impressed him with sympathy and benevolence in the execution of his mission. But, instead of this, he enters the city with denunciation. And malediction in his mouth, crying, Chap. 3. Ver. 4. Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. We have now to consider this supposed missionary in the last act of his mission. And here it is that the malevolent spirit of a Bible prophet, or of a protecting priest, appears in all that blackness of character that men ascribe to the being they call the devil. Having published his predictions, he withdrew, says the story, to the east side of the city. But for what? Not to contemplate, in retirement, the mercy of his creator to himself or to others, but to wait, with malignant impatience, the destruction of Nineveh. It came to pass, however, as the story relates that the Ninevites reformed, and that God, according to the Bible phrase, repented him of the evil he had said he would do unto them, and did it not. This, saith the first verse of the last chapter, displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. His obdurate heart would rather that all Nineveh should be destroyed, and every soul, young and old, perish in its ruins, than that his prediction should not be fulfilled. To expose the character of a prophet still more, a garret is made to grow up in the night, that promised him an agreeable shelter from the heat of the sun, in the place to which he had retired, and the next morning it dies. Here the rage of the prophet becomes excessive, and he is ready to destroy himself. It is better, said he, for me to die than to live. This brings on a supposed expostulation between the Almighty and the Prophet, in which the former says, Dost thou well to be angry for the God? And Jonah said, I do well to be angry even unto death. Then, said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the God, for which thou hast not labored, neither mad as did grow, which came up in the night, and perished in the night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city? in which are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand. Here is both the winding up of the satire and the moral of the fable. As a satire, it strikes against the character of all the Bible prophets, and against all the indiscriminate judgments upon men, women, and children, with which this lying book, the Bible, is crowded, such as Noah's flood, the destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, the extirpation of the Canaanites, even to the sucking infants, and women with child, because the same reflection, that there are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, meaning young children, applies to all their cases. It satirizes also the supposed partiality of the Creator for one nation more than for another. As a moral, it preaches against the malevolent spirit of prediction, for as certainly as a man predicts ill, he becomes inclined to wish it. The pride of having his judgment right hardens his heart, till at last he beholds with satisfaction, or sees with disappointment, the accomplishment or the failure of his predictions. This book ends with the same kind of strong and well-directed point against prophets, prophecies, and indiscriminate judgment, as the chapter that Benjamin Franklin made for the Bible, about Abraham and the stranger, ends against the intolerant spirit of religious persecution. Thus much for the book of Jonah. Of the poetical parts of the Bible, that are called prophecies, I have spoken in the former part of the Age of Reason, and already in this, where I have said that the word prophet is the Bible word for poet, and that the flights and metaphors of those poets, many of which have become obscure by the lapse of time and the change of circumstances, have been ridiculously erected into things called prophecies, and applied to purposes the writers never thought of. When a priest quotes any of those passages, he unridles it agreeably to his own views, and imposes that explanation upon his congregation as the meaning of the writer. The horror of Babylon has been the common horror of all the priests, and each has accused the other of keeping the strumpet. So well do they agree in their explanations. There now remain only a few books, which they call books of the lesser prophets, and as I have already shown that the greater are impostors, it would be cowardice to disturb the repose of the little ones.
let them sleep, then, in the arms of their nurses, the priests, and both be forgotten together. I have now gone through the Bible, as a man would go through a wood with an axe on his shoulder, and fell trees. Here they lie, and the priests, if they can, may replant them. They may, perhaps, stick them in the ground, but they will never make them grow. I pass on to the books of the New Testament. 